Well, hello, and welcome to another Twitch session with me. My name is Scott Claus, and I'm going to be working on some 2D animations tonight and talking to uh, talking about 2D animation and discussing some various aspects on a scene that I've been working on for a while. Uh, as usually happens when I'm first getting started, I always like to check in with anybody in who happens to be out there and make sure that we've got visual, we've got audio. Uh, if you guys can see and hear me, if uh, someone was feeling kindly tonight and could type into the chat window, I'd also like to just check and make sure my chats are working as well so we can uh, talk and hang out. But uh, welcome. Awesome. Thank you. So, uh, yeah, welcome. Um, so what I like to do first is what I usually do at the beginning of these sessions is just show you what I'm working on. Um, but for anything, um, this is in the service of CG Spectrum. Uh, it's a school that I work for and uh, there are many different disciplines that you can focus on at this school and uh, CG being the operative word computer graphics. Uh, I'm going to be doing 2D with the aid of computer graphics. But there are a lot of other different kinds of classes that are available at the school too. So uh, be sure and check out the website if you are interested in learning anything about graphics that are aided with computers. And so uh, that is uh, just something I like to point out right at the head. We got CG Spectrum, cool. And so I'm gonna now go into my work file and show you what I've been working on. Uh, if you've been here before, you may recognize this scene. I've been working on it for a while. I like to point out that animation takes time. Uh, so just for the record, uh, I don't work on this too often during the week because I don't really have a lot of time right now for that. But uh, um, yes, it's a time consuming process. So um, one of these days, I'm gonna pop this open and you'll, if you stick with me, you'll see that uh, I've got a monster finished as well um, but for the time being I'm still in the process of cleaning it up so I'm going to talk about animation in respect to this scene again uh, but maybe talk about some different things that I have in different uh, twitch streams but first of all let me just show you the scene in case anyone's curious this is what it looks like I'll turn off that top layer so you can see the monster cleanup and not uh, see it with the cleanup pass just yet so I've done the character, the hero character. Um, in previous streams, I've talked about how that came together. I used reference and then did a rough pass, which looks like this. I can show you the rough pass just for fun. And um, then once I had the rough pass done, I tied it down and then went ahead and put a cleanup line on it and then colored it. And um, so what I'm doing today is I'm now doing that same treatment for the monster. So the same thing that I did with the uh, hero character where I went through and I cleaned it up. I'm going to be doing that in the midst of doing that with the monster. And while I'm doing that, that leaves me free to field any questions or comments or discussions about anything that you might be interested in uh, discussing. Go ahead and type it into the chat and get that going. I'll be happy to respond to you or uh, anyone else who wants to poke in here, they can comment too. In lieu of that, without any questions, what I'll do is I will just continue to talk about animation, uh, the work that I'm working on, anything particular to this scene, as well as anything that's particular to animation and uh, the animation business, which everyone's interested in hearing about as well, both past, present, and future. Some might um, be aware that I have a lot of stories from my long and harried career uh, working for Disney and DreamWorks and Rhythm and Hughes and then some other small studios. So uh, I'm always happy to share stories about working on the front lines on some really amazing movies that I got to work on, uh, including Pocahontas, El Dorado, and uh, Golden Compass, Hulk, Cabin in the Woods, Life of Pi, those are just some of my favorites, but I've worked on, I think, last count, I think I had 20 something films in 20 something years, pretty much one film a year. 
and just about every one of them I stand behind and, and I'm proud of. Anyway, so that's my uh, project that I'm working on this week. Well, Morning Shark, I'm sorry I missed you last week as well. Yeah, you were missed, so uh, welcome back and glad to have you here. And please feel free to uh, converse <laughs> at any time while I'm working on this stuff, um, since you've probably already seen it anyway. But uh, anyway, so that was the character rough, and then this is the character cleaned up. Um, you can see on the sidelines, you can see these charts. I don't often talk about this enough. Um, I think I certainly I got out of the habit of doing it. When I was doing CG animation, I did not worry as much about charts, but charts are really important. And uh, there are different philosophies about when you put the charts in, when uh, you use them, when you don't. Uh, but I think that the important thing is that you just get used to using them if you want to be an animator. Uh, if you want to be a CG animator, not so much. Not necessarily uh, something that you're going to have to concentrate on if you're doing CG animation. But guess what? You probably want to know about it anyway. And so um, what I'm talking about is basically the... Uh, let's pull this up here. Um, basically, I'm talking about this over here on this side of the screen. That is called a chart, and it's worth mentioning. Uh, what it's saying is, basically, there's a key drawing at 34, that's why it's got a circle around it. There's a key drawing at 40, that's why it's got a circle. And then the, the line drawn represents more or less a timeline. And then this is this first one represents a halfway point between 34 and 40. And then these drawings, these lines, just help reinforce uh, that this is a halfway point. And then in between that, you've got 36 which is halfway between 34 and 40, as far as the position of the drawing itself goes, and then 35, which is half again between 34 and 36. And so it sounds like a lot of math. It isn't. Once you get used to thinking in terms of this, uh, like I said, in 2D, it's, it's essential. In CG, it's just good to think in terms of that. Uh, just keep that in the back of your mind when you're doing your uh, CG animation work. Um, it's because uh, even though you don't have a physical chart necessarily, uh, you're still thinking in terms of well, what's halfway between this and what's halfway between that. I happen to know, well, last time I checked anyway, that Ken Duncan was still using the chart system, even I think for CG animation, he developed something for that. Uh, Ken Duncan, who was essential for doing uh, Meg on Hercules and um, Jane for Tarzan, and then his studio did the animation for the Mary Poppins sequel that came out a couple years ago. So they're still using the charts, and I think that it's a, a valuable tool. Uh, got a comment. And rhythming needs clothes. You know, if the artists were able to find work again quickly. Well, to answer the first part of that, um, some people never left. There are still some some people in uh, who worked at Rhythm and Hughes who are still there. And it's not. Um, Rhythm and Hughes anymore, it's Rhythm uh, without the Hughes. And John Hughes, that's where they got the Hughes name, he actually uh, went and opened up a studio recently, well, within the last year or so. Um, he opened a studio overseas and is continuing to work in that capacity as far as I know. I haven't checked in on him, I haven't heard from him lately, so I don't know. I was never real close with John anyway. I found him kind of, uh, well, thank you for that following sounds like somebody followed sorry my chat's not updating very quickly but so necessarily what else going on but uh, sounds like somebody followed and I appreciate that thank you um, so John Hughes I'm not sure that uh, he was the most open and easily person to talk to but he uh, was very nice but he was um, very to the point and so I, I never really got to be good friends with them. But there are people I know who still work there. Uh, Mike Hosel, Michael Hosel, who I think is probably one of the greatest living effects artists going for creature effects work. He uh, did, uh, if there's anything in Life of Pi that looks like it's a real tiger, without question, you know, where there's, you can't even tell if the tiger is real or not, then it was probably Michael Hosel who did it. And uh, he just, his brain just works that way. He is Australian, 
Uh, so for anyone who's uh, native Australian, who's part of CT Spectrum, or even for those who aren't, but understand that CT Spectrum has a lot of ties to Australia. That is Michael Hosel's story. And uh, so he's still there as far as I know. Uh, and then um, there are other people, I'm not gonna do name drops, but uh, anyway, yeah, so they kept going. I actually, I have it on good order. Somebody had said, hey, Scott, if you're interested in coming back and doing some work, they could use a hand uh, when they were doing uh, it was Game of Thrones. And I, I considered it because it was a great place to work. And if you are interested in doing creature effects, uh, it's a great family environment, or at least last time I checked, last time I know someone. I had a student who ended up uh, going there. And he actually asked me at some point, do you think I should really try this? Because it didn't think close. But uh, they were in the swing of doing uh, Game of Thrones at that point. And um, I knew that he'd be a great match. He was an excellent animator who is currently at MPC, which is another great effects studio. I know that they've maybe had some hard times in their Vancouver studio after, um, what was it, the Lion King. I think that they worked on Lion King and that, that may have been a frustrating place for them. But um, but uh, they're, they're still one of the best studios out there that are still carrying the torch and doing uh, excellent VFX work. We worked with them, with MPC on Life of Pi. So that was a co-production well, I mean, I think everybody in town works on things now, but um, for Life of Pi, that's how I got to know NPC and some of the people who worked there. And just, I thought they were great, that they were really cool and they did excellent work. So uh, yeah, they were involved with the Detective Pikachu too. Yeah, yeah, I think, yeah, that's what I heard as well. Um, so I was just thrilled that uh, Rhythm and Hughes kept going as Hughes. <laughs> or sorry, has rhythm. Hughes is the one that's overseas. Uh, I was just thrilled that they were able to keep it up, and I would have, I would have liked to have actually gone in and, and worked for them again, um, because, as far as I know, they actually changed the studio to being closer to where I lived. Um, so I would have been able to just walk down the street and work at my own old studio. That wouldn't have been bad. But uh, no, I. Uh, people ask me all the time, are you done? Are you going to ever work on another film? And I, I just said that I'm semi-retired. It'd have to be something really special, probably something for a friend. And they would probably really want to have to demand me. I mean, I'm not sure that I would even uh, be in demand at this point. One of the reasons I became a teacher was so that I could give other people a chance. I know that sounds silly, but sometimes it really does come down to a, a matter of uh, musical chairs. It's like, well, we just have so many places on this show and you're an established artist that we don't want to lose and you're on staff or whatever. And so we can't bring more people on. And meanwhile, you've got somebody who's sitting there grousing about, well, free dinner is not as good tonight as it was last night or whatever, because they're just sort of burnt out and jaded. And um, before I became burnt out and jaded, I decided it was time for me to leave the, the arena and let someone else have their turn, especially as long as I have something else that I can do, which is teaching. So, well, hello there, John Skull. <laughs> nice to see you again. Um, I think it's possible to bring back live action animation hybrid movies like Who Framed Director Rabbit and Space Jam. Well, think of it this way all films now are hybrids. There are a few big budget films that don't have some sort of digital art in them. And so they are all relying on CG art uh, in one way or another, even if it's just pre-production, think about that. You know, that at some point somebody was sitting there in Photoshop or Illustrator or one of the myriad of the programs and creating pre-production work, creating uh, animatics. And so um, that's one of the things that we like to keep mentioning at least I do in my classes, that there are so many jobs out there that you don't even realize exist that are digital based. But, uh, but so that's the, the truth of the matter with um, the fact that all films are now hybrid. Lion King was an animated film, you know, whether, whether they said it or not. Uh, Star Wars movies, those are animated films um, 
when uh, vast when, when they have non-human characters in them that are actual speaking parts that are part of the narrative uh, you know at that point that is roger rabbit but i think maybe what you're asking is are there going to be uh, you know cartoony films where actual cartoon characters are interacting well i mean somebody just you know they just mentioned pikachu uh, that is an example of that i worked on one called hop the uh alvin on the chipmunks movies those were uh, hybrid films where animated characters are living in the real world but the difference everyone always points out is is well it just doesn't look the same so am i gonna see um, yeah and then mary poppins thank you uh mary poppins returns um, that was characters mingling with live action characters in a 2d environment uh, here's the thing and i say this a lot and it it implies that there's some guilt to be found somewhere which i don't mean to but uh what i always want to point out is is hollywood doesn't discriminate in that sense at least as far as well i want to see more 2d hollywood responds to money if they make something and people love it and they pay money to rent it or buy it or stream it or watch it or own it then hollywood will make another one because that's just that's how it, it's always worked it's not personal, it's not something to be, it's, it's not that people are stupid, necessarily. It's just that uh, um, money talks in Hollywood and they'll make whatever people wanna see. And I know that a lot of my friends and traditional animation enthusiasts supported Mary Poppins. I don't know that anybody else did. Now it also wasn't a 2D animated film. It was based on something that uh, people my age middle-aged whatever you want to call it um people my age were aware of mary poppins and fond of it and grew it up with it and were sentimental about it and we're happy to well i haven't seen it but a lot of my peers have seen it and they said that it was very authentic and but i don't know that young people were all that jazzed about it i don't know people who are um you know the same people who supported spider-verse did they go see mary poppins returns don't know uh but I, I, I tend to think not. I don't know that it knocked everybody's socks off, which is a shame because if you go online and look at some of the effects work, uh, it's gorgeous stuff. But there is an original Mary Poppins. We've seen it. And it's sort of like, what else you got? Oh, flying bikes? I don't know. I mean, I'm not criticizing. I'm just saying I don't know. I'm glad I don't have to make those decisions. So they didn't make another one. And they won't make another one until it makes money. I think people may have seen there's a uh, Roger Rabbit clip that's been floating around lately. I don't know how long it's been out there, but Roger Rabbit done as a CG animated character, um, but it looks like the old school Roger Rabbit from the 2D film from 1988. And uh, I mean, it's glorious. It's a beautiful thing. I don't know how long it took him to make. I think it, it says Eric Goldberg did it. I don't know if he did it or not. Um, but to me, it looks so much like the original that why wouldn't you just do it 2D? It'd be probably faster or, you know, do it any way you like. But uh, I would be very curious to see if people really are interested in that, if that is something that they would want to see. Uh, I enjoyed Roger Rabbit at the time. I haven't seen it in years because uh, I saw it enough when I was a kid, when I was younger. Um, so I don't know. I don't know if there's a market for that or not. And uh, it was awfully expensive to make and to do it right would be expensive. So Hollywood just isn't, they're reluctant to, uh, to take chances like that. That's all I can say. But boy, just one success and watch all the copycats. Uh, so much cool world day after talk to you two weeks. Yeah, cool world, something else, isn't it? <laughs> Well, first of all, Drawn Skills decided to focus heavily on the filmmaking skills and 2D animation. Well, yeah, I mean, it's only going to take one. And there are plenty of people out there who are excited enough about this stuff that they are exploring different options. And there's absolutely no reason why you couldn't do a really killer uh, 2D animation hybrid film just like the old days and be successful with it and then watch everybody line up to be the next one who has a piece of that. So, um, I say this about everything. Don't let anything stop you from doing the kinds of things you want to do. Don't wait for somebody else to do it. Be the one who does it.
and uh, watch people line up to give you a job <laughs> to do it again if, if you are successful. Uh, but so, um, yeah, so I'm glad that people are focusing on 2D and, and I'm glad that it's sort of facing a renaissance these days because I, I never, none of us ever understood why it had to go in the way in the first place. There's no, oh, we have to get rid of this so another one can live. <laughs> it's just silly. So uh, good for everybody who keeps the torch going. You're going to be the ones who are at the start of it if it does have a renaissance. I'm not saying it will, will. I don't know. I can't see that far into the future. Uh, but if it does, there are a lot of people who are going to be who've been sitting in the wings waiting who will uh, be happy to work on it or happy to keep it going. Uh, now, Cool World, <laughs> that's another story. Um, I don't know if anyone's actually really interested in what I know about Cool World, but uh, uh, there's some fun stuff that goes with it. Basically, if you have seen the entire film, if you got to the end of it, um, you may remember that there's this whole sequence at the end where it goes full on 2D and they're all flying around Vegas and it gets very stylized and it gets very... Uh, different looking than it's looked in the rest of the film. It gets very cartoony and, and stylish, and uh, I think it's just wonderful. The last 15 minutes or so of the animation in Cool World is just absolutely the kind of stuff I got into the business to do. And um, as far as I know, I can't confirm this, <laughs> I happily suffered through it. I've been told, I have not experienced this myself, I've been, uh, it's been explained to me that if you are, are altered in some way, shall we say, um, that Cool World suddenly takes on a whole new meaning and is a lot of fun. Uh, but I'm not endorsing anything. I'm not saying anything. I'm just gently suggesting that that is what I've been told. And uh, so whatever. But I, I mean, I never, I like it for what it is. I haven't seen it in years, but when I saw it, I, I thought it was great. But uh, Ralph saw the end of the film, Ralph Bakshi, the director, who I'm, I have Never worked for, but he influenced my work a lot. He saw the end of the film, and he goes, "Well, no, that's what we should have been doing all along. Why didn't we do it that way all along? How come the we, you know, did the film? You know, he talks like that. He's got this. I don't know where he's from, Brooklyn, probably. Um, but he's very outspoken. If you look him up, uh, he's done some TED talks and stuff, and he's a lot of fun. And um, so he." Uh, they finally kind of hit their stride by the end of the film and the look of it ended up being what he's like, oh, wait, this cartoony, wild, fun look um, is what we should have been doing. He also, you can look this stuff up online, I won't go on and on about it, but uh, he had a lot of problems with that production and Money Men, you know, saying you got to do this, you got to do that, you got to do it this way. And so the film shows a lot of uh, back and forth, you can see a lot of fighting. And my part in it, because I actually did work on it, believe it or not, even I forget that sometimes, um, I did Celsar Xeroxing on that film briefly. And what we were doing, uh, the part that we were working on, there are all these floating skulls that are slowly undulating through the, the film. Um, and they move kind of like spirits. There are all these weird things. Well, what happened was, is they got to the end and uh, they, somebody said that it wasn't crazy enough. It wasn't manic enough. They needed more. They needed more stuff going on. So every conceivable frame of that film is packed with action and things moving and undulating, twisting. And so when I first started out in the business, my job at another studio, not Bakshi's studio, but at this studio where we did outsource was to Xerox drawings that would then be painted in the paint department. And I'm painting all these skulls going, what on earth kind of a movie is this? What, uh, what is this film? And, um, and uh, you know, what's the story with it? I knew Roger, I'm sorry, I knew Ralph Bakshi's work. And I was very excited about seeing something new from him, but these ominous looking Gothic skulls twisting and undulating around the point is what kind of a movie is this anyway? And when I saw it, I, I understood a little bit better. Uh, so that was my brief and there were other things too the whole spider guy and, and a couple other things where we're like it looks like a hybrid between 1930s the wiggly arm style i don't know if you guys know what that is but it's like the old mickey mouse cartoons where the arms look like tubes and uh it's crossed between that and then you've got the hollywood character who looks like something out of 
you know, something naughty, <laughs> you know, it's a little bit more adult. And, and all these mixtures of styles in this film called Cool World with Brad Pitt, who nobody knew who he was anyway, back then. And I was very curious to see what it was, was in the end. <laughs> so, yeah, rubber hose animation. Um, so, uh, I found it a little, be a little overwhelming and distracting because the random things, but appreciated that. I didn't think it was bad because it was intentional. Well, I mean, it was and it wasn't. It was intentional. I mean, they put in all that stuff when they thought, oh, well, it's, uh, this film needs to be amped up a little bit. Um, but uh, yeah, it, it, that's the problem people have with that film is it's all over the place. And that, that's kind of what I thought when I saw it. I'm like, well, somewhere in there, there's a cool movie. Uh, I mean, it's a cool movie, but I mean, somewhere in there is a very linear story, and yeah, I'm sure they started out with great intentions, but it got lost along the way. Um, Drawn School Year asks, what tablets are good for character design, 2D animation, and storyboard art? Good work on the iPad. Uh, I'm a firm believer in Huion. I will hold this up so you can see this. Uh, I'm not endorsing anybody. I'm just saying this is what I use, and I'm a firm believer in it. Um, my experiences with Wacom's were that they were, how do I say this, I don't want to say anything bad about them. I'm just, when I was doing research and the ones I'd worked for, it was like there were uh, problems, just technical problems. And I'm like, I need one that is uh, the simplest thing in the world because I want to get up and running uh, quickly. And so I started off with a Huey on it. I swear by it. I mean, if you, if you've got the money, get a Cintiq that's, you know, get, get an actual, like a full size 16 field or, or bigger Cintiq if you can afford it. But um, for what I do, which is basically on the hobby level at this point, um, I couldn't justify getting something that's that intensive. But I worked on them. I worked with them at Rhythm and Hughes, they had them. And that's how I'd give notes on CG animation, was I would draw overlays on a Cintiq and it was wonderful. It was glorious. So uh, if you have the means and you have the opportunity, I can't recommend one enough. But for me, uh, this Huion that I've got is fantastic. It just works great. So no complaints yet so far. It's been a couple years. Yeah, I'll let you guys make comments about things, about products. I'm not going to um, record myself saying that a product is good or bad, and I don't think I have enough experience to be able to say that it, uh, that something is um, that good or that bad necessarily. So, um, so yeah, I'll leave it up to you guys to, to make those determinations. Yeah, I'm, I'm dumb, but I'm not that dumb. I'm not going to <laughs> go on and say that I think uh, Wacom is anything. And I don't, again, I don't really even have that much experience with them. So, uh, so I will leave that. But yes, um, I have had great experiences with Helion. I've been you know, working with it for some day, time now. And I had uh, had a crash with my Mac. And so I had to transfer everything to, um, I had to transfer everything into a PC world. And I have to say that the, the transition was flawless. So as far as do I, you know, endorse you on it? Yeah, I certainly would, um, without shame, without any reservations whatsoever. So yes, um, getting back to, questions sorry so yes um yeah i heard they're making another space jam as well uh, i believe they're making it as a as a uh, cg animated uh, they're going kind of spider-verse with it as far as i know um and uh, and then the tom and jerry movie if you go to imdb.com you'll see that i'm working on the tom and jerry movie even though i'm not <laughs> working on the tom and jerry movie i don't know they just I think mixed me up. I worked on the 2D animated Tom and Jerry film that came out in the 90s, uh, where the first thing that they did was is they said, hey, we can talk. Let's talk to each other and let's be friends and help each other with this quest. We were not impressed. <laughs> Those of us who uh, remember Tom and Jerry were rather surprised that that was the first thing that happened in the film, but hey, 
not complaining, not arguing, just saying. I thought that was kind of funny. But so yes, yeah, so I have so far been credited with working on the Tom and Jerry film, even though I uh, definitely not working on it. I think that's kind of funny, and it's very hard to get stuff taken off of credits on IMDb. I had a credit on Heavy Metal, the movie. Um, for years and I was not old enough to go see that when it came out uh, by myself so I think it's kind of funny that I would be credited with working on an R-rated film when I couldn't even go see them when it was out. Ah. Hey Restream, <laughs> nice to see you. You're watching Tom and Jerry cartoons right now. Well, I think that um, that uh, those probably should be rated R. And some of them I think would probably be rated R now. You can't uh, show certain things that they used to do in those films, uh, even the edited ones. I know that the Tex Avery ones are definitely not safe anymore. There's a lot of violence and uh, adult humor, I guess that's what they'd call it. And then of course the racism that doesn't go over too well, which I have mixed feelings about that. Let's not even talk about that. How's that? We'll just leave that one alone. But um, yeah, the Tom and Jerry, they could get pretty, pretty brutal at times. Not the movie. <laughs> the movie was, was, they did not beat each other up. But uh, the original cartoons were pretty, pretty intense. Oh, and Fantasia, yep. <laughs> it's much different Fantasia. I figured something's because of the small section effect. Yeah, Fantasia is one of my favorites. I, uh, First, just want to check. Ah, you guys are funny. Um, yeah, so uh, I just I talk about Fantasia any chance I get. It's one of my favorite films. I think it holds up remarkably well, even though it gets lambasted pretty regularly for looking really old-fashioned and just being dull. I don't think it's dull at all. I watch. I mean, you got to be in the mood for it, but I watch it um, all, all the time and. I don't necessarily watch the whole thing from beginning to end, it's over two hours long, but each sequence, you can learn from it. Each thing, each sequence has something you can glean. For example, uh, to this day, I would point to people who want to do effects, fire, lava, water, smoke, um, the elements. Uh, look at the Rite of Spring se sequence with the dinosaurs in Fantasia, and uh, there is a primer on how to look at effects, how to study them, and render them in a stylized way. And I know lots of people who love that stuff. And I think that it's a great resource at Fantasia for a lot of different styles of animation, um, which was the, the point. Um, and then uh, Hunchback of Notre Dame, it's one of the few films of mine that, that I worked on. Mine. One of the few films that I worked on that I can actually still watch because I think it um, it's different. It's really uh, not the usual fare. It, it certainly wasn't made for children initially. When the Brizzi brothers boarded it out, I tell, tell this story all the time, but uh, the original boards that I saw, this was right after I agreed to stay at the studio, uh, were done by the Brizzi brothers, famous twin duo who uh, created storyboards for the film and it was dark you can look this stuff up online just type in britzy uh, storyboards hunchback and you'll see what i'm talking about they were very dark very grim not a happy little fun family film and things changed a little bit once they realized that they might not be able to sell a film that was that dark to the public who had you know to be fair they just come off of lion king and aladdin and a bunch of other films and we're probably not in the mood for a dark, grim story like that. And so they chickened out and uh, they created a film that they toned it down and they added the gargoyles, made them funnier. They were still there all along, but they made them a little more cutesy and they included a new song that was very cute and silly to try and just lighten things up. And some of us were working on it. We actually thought that it, it made it uh, very it was in kind of poor taste to have a song while Paris is burning and everything is, you know, really at a very serious moment in the film. And suddenly you've got these gargoyles jumping around and singing songs, but uh, that's why I'm not in story. That's why, or at least wasn't in story at Disney. And those were decisions that were not up to me to make and nobody really cared what I thought.
for any of us. So, um, but I think it's interesting. It's an interesting film, and I really like watching it. And it's just one of the most beautiful films in the 2D animation era of the 90s. That one in Prince of Egypt, I think. Well, in El Dorado, which I've also worked on. Uh, they're just unbelievably beautiful, the backgrounds and the animation and the amount of love that went into making them is unparalleled. I know because I was there, we worked on it, and I was one of the people putting all that love into it, at least doing my part. Um, so yeah, I, I really like uh, Hunchback, and then I, I liked American Tale. That was one of the films that got me really excited about, ooh, maybe I can do this. I'd always thought I could or wanted to, but once it came out and was a success, a reasonably successful film, um, it was like, oh, maybe they're going to make animation again. Just so you guys know, I mean, when I started out, there was no animation business. People say, oh, well, there's no animation business now. Well, there wasn't one when I started, and that didn't stop me. I did it anyway. And more or less, once the business picked up again, I was there waiting with my pencil handy. Uh, but, I mean, you can't repeat the past. You can't go back. There will never be a time like that again. And who'd want it? it? It happened. It's your turn. You know, other people have their turn now. But, uh, just as um, well, if you're talking about um, doing a live action Hunchback, I mean, why wouldn't they? They've done everything else. And they had a live show. And I, as far as I know, it did fine. They did a live show of Hunchback. I think they had one at one of the parks, but they actually did a live Broadway version of it. And it did all right. And, you know, hey, more power to them. I, I don't, people ask me, well, how do you feel about that? Because you worked on it. Do you feel it's portrayal and all that? No, the film still exists. What difference does it make? And if it eclipses it, well, then that's what people want and try to stop what people want. And if, like I said, if the 2D films are what people want to see, then that's what they'll make more of them. And if not, then they won't. And that's just the way the cookie crumbles. But again, it's up to people like you guys. If you're into something, go out and support it and make sure that uh, Hollywood knows that you're into it so that uh, so that, um, that they'll make more of them. But um, so John Skull says, well, look at this. We're going to 2D in this company, learn animation, or should you take computer animation course? Yeah, so if you want to learn computer animation, um, then you're going to have to take computer animation courses, such as the ones offered at uh, cgspectrum.com um, because it is a different discipline. The things like the 12 principles, those are universal, right? You're going to get those no matter what animation course you take. But CG animation is a very different animal than 2D, and so you want to um, focus on that if that's something that you're interested in getting hired to do. Um, and the stuff that I'm doing here on screen, you know, this is related to drawing. You know, what all I'm doing right now, if you guys may have noticed, is I'm just drawing. I'm just going over uh, my roughs and I'm turning them into cleanup rough passes. That's because I draw. And uh, whether or not I draw at a level that anybody would be impressed by, that's um, neither here nor there. The point is I have years and years of having been paid. I think I can say I was a professional artist for Disney, for DreamWorks. Um, I earned the pedigree of, of being paid for my work as an artist uh, for however long that lasted. That is a very different thing than the stuff that I did at um, DreamWorks, the CG animation I did, and the CG creature effects stuff I did at Rhythm and Hughes. Um, is all very different than the 2D animation stuff that I grew up doing, that I learned to do in the business, and that I now teach. It's a different discipline. So yeah, you want to take specific classes for specific disciplines, and it's unlikely that at a studio would be asked to cross over in that in those disciplines, unless it's a like three person studio. Um, so something to just keep in mind as you go is uh, what do I want to focus on? I made a career out of being a jack of all trades, master of none. Um, meaning I was never master at, I, I you could probably say I qualified as a master level for cleanup, 
Um, there were very few of us who actually probably would be comfortable saying that, but uh, I don't consider that something that required a master level. As much as I loved it, and as much as I love res respect my peers and all of us who did it, um, I don't know. It's, it's not for me to say. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, I don't think I was a master of anything in particular. I just did it all, and I did it all because I loved it. And, and that's why I came up with this idea, you should love what you do and do what you love. So, uh, I've seen some of the live action films in the past. Yeah, fair enough, you know, but I, I'm not going to bash it. It's just, that's the thing. Um, because you want to do experiments on hybrids. Well, that's an excellent idea. Um, doing hybrids for John Skull. Um, because, of, well, first of all, I think that's what the way of the future is. I think that. Um, uh, in the same way that now, like I said, live action films are animated films, I think you may find soon um, that, that people are finding different ways to do hybrids of all sorts of things. Um, anime, uh, obviously, is still something that um, people, with the focus of it, the, people, the thing people love about it is the 2D-ness of it, the hand-drawn, illustrative quality of it. Um, that is one of the draws of it, so if that's something that you want to do, you probably better be good at, at uh, drawing. But even anime is facing a state now where um, the animated films is like, well, how does that translate into CG animation? Can you do hybrids of 2D, 3D with that? And uh, of course you can. And so to be able to do that would put you at the front lines of whatever's coming next but then the question is well but what do I study what software are they going to use what what will be the thing that's going to keep you cutting edge that's a little bit tougher and I get that question all the time what should I be studying what software programs what's going to be the next big thing and my philosophy is is you don't want to be a tech chaser necessarily unless that's what you really love if that's what you really love to do then by all means go out and, and chase down the latest and greatest tech technology but my personal experience has been if you have an understanding of the art of it if that's where your heart lies then you're always going to be able to find your place because you have the hard skills that are required it isn't just about um, oh well I know I'm trying to think if there's some maybe you guys know some obsolete uh, software. I know that for compositing, Shake uh, became obsolete just about the time I thought, well, maybe I would uh, get it to do compositing as a way to uh, stay relevant after 2D died and other things happened. And uh, the first day of the class, the, the teacher goes, yeah, so they're not going to do Shake anymore. Ha ha ha. Um, but he was the one who taught me. He says, but that doesn't mean they're not going to do compositing. They're not going to do node system compositing anymore. Uh, it just means that Shake isn't going to be the one. And so if you know how to do compositing, then it's okay to learn shape because that will make you better at it, ultimately. And uh, that is what I found to be the case. I did not become a compositor, but I did see a lot of that come true, what he had said. So do you follow the latest and greatest software program or do you become good at something like Maya, which is a really tough program to master. And then once you've mastered that, everything becomes easier. Uh, you see another program and you go, oh, huh, yeah, that's just like in Maya. Um, so that is my recommendation is find something, whatever it is that you like to do, find the program that is the sort of end all be all, get good at that one. And then everything else after that is going to be old hat. And in this case, Maya, I think that it is still the industry standard and will be for some time. And it's certainly one of the more challenging programs going so learn that and life just gets easier and easier <laughs> and uh, and then you've got a program like that under your belt which again is industry standard to begin with so hooray um, but you have to do something you have to start somewhere so don't let that stop you if you're like well I don't know what to do so I guess I'll just keep thinking about it don't get stuck into that rut do something, make a mistake, waste some time, make, waste some money if you have to, but um, 
continue moving forward and trying things and learning it. And at the least, at the very end of it, you'll go, okay, well, I know that's not what I want. But it, but along the way, you probably will have met people, you'll have evolved and you've gotten better and you'll practiced. And uh, so just keep keep going. That's, that's the only thing that I can really say never changes and never uh, goes out of style is that you, you love what you're doing so much that you do it even on your free time, even when it makes people that are around you crazy because you just do it all the time. Um, that's probably a good sign. So I don't say it about like I do. <laughs> well, well, I don't know. I mean, there's, there's, here's what I like to say too is, um, and I say this in my classes a lot, if you find yourself doing something like, uh, let's say you're playing games rather than doing something towards making them, I say listen to that voice. That voice tells you that there's something in there that you should be paying attention to. That maybe you don't like it enough or you don't care enough or whatever. Maybe it just means you're not hungry enough, right? But somewhere in there is a conversation that you gotta have with yourself about, okay, when I'm doing this, I'm happy and when I'm doing that, I'm not. Um, at the risk of an old time story that I've probably told a lot, but um, I, when I was early in my career, I was started out as an editor and, or I was heading in the direction of being an editor because I didn't think that animation was viable. I didn't think, I listened when they told me there were no jobs, that even though it was what I loved and maybe meant to do, but um, you know, I had to get a job. I was out of college. What am I going to do? So I became a driver for an editing house through a friend of a friend. It was a great uh, first entry into the world of Hollywood as a naive kid from Oregon. And so I got this job and I was grateful and I gave it everything I had. I was like, I'm going to be the best driver the world's ever known. Um, Cause that's just kind of how my mind works and just worked at it. I worked at it at being a driver. So one day, um, this person came up to me, uh, who I worked with and he said, listen, there was an option to make you, to promote you to the next level. You could have become an assistant editor, but when you're not working, what I see you do is you go into the kitchen, you talk to people in the kitchen, you know, you hang out with them, um, or you sit and you draw. What I don't see you doing is working on the editing bays and practicing and getting better and better. We had an opportunity, somebody asked you, I didn't know that this was a trick question, but somebody had asked me, they said, well, would you like to become an editor? And you said, this is quoting me, I said, Scott, you said to that person, oh, I don't know. I'm not sure. I'm still thinking about it. And um, the fact that you said that told me what I needed to know, which is you don't love it enough. You're not interested. And so instead of hiring you, bumping you up from driver to assistant editor, I could have done that. I hired somebody from outside who's starting on Monday and now you're going to be picking up stuff from them and delivering stuff and they'll be in charge of you and you're going to continue to drive around Hollywood uh, with all the nasty people who used to walk around the streets uh, then I won't go into that, but um, it was a different environment back then in the early 90s. And, uh, and you know, and if, if it's something you want to do, if you want to be an editor, then by all means, show me. But you're going to have to show me because you didn't. And so uh, so just, just wanted to let you know. Now, my first thought was, wow, what a jerk. <laughs> and uh, I'm not sure. Sometimes I, I vacillate back and forth between whether or not he actually really was a jerk or not. But what it did is I got mad. I got really upset and I was young and just getting started. And now I was going to be stuck being the driver again. And so when another person at the studio uh, came up to me and said that he too had been kind of overlooked when it came time for promotions, he was the one who helped me find the first studio that I worked at. And he was the one who kind of urged me to work really hard at, at getting into that studio and it was because of his sister-in-law walking out the door at the same exact moment I was walking in or vice versa that I ended up getting into animation but here's that's a whole nother story I've told it a thousand times if you want me to tell it again I'm happy to but here's the, the punchline to the story I'm telling about this guy who was ostensibly a jerk to me um, I walked into him one day and I said so um just so you know, I got a job at an animation studio and I'm going to be working for them now. And so I'm giving my notice two weeks and then I'm not going to be working for you guys anymore. So, uh -huh, sorry. 
And he kind of looked at me and he smiled and he goes, ah, now that's what I was looking for, that kind of passion. He says, I am so happy that you found it. You found what you were interested in and you're, you're passionate about. He said, I knew you had it in you and I knew all along you weren't meant to be in editing, that you, you, your heart was somewhere else. I just didn't know what it was. He says, but he says, you go get them, pal. He says, in fact, if you need any help, if you're, because I was still negotiating my salary, I think. And he says, if you need any help with that, you let me know, because I know what rates are and stuff and I know what you're worth. And he also, he helped me move. He says, when it comes time for you, because you're going to have to move there. It's too far away for you to drive uh, where you're living now, which was uh, near the beach. But he said, if you need help with that, um, I know where good places to live are. And I know what rates are uh, for apartments. And I won't steer you wrong. He says, I am just happy that you found the right direction. Yes. So, <laughs> so yes. So did the person uh, not value me or did they value me more? He just was... Uh, in an indirect way kind of teaching me a lesson um there's a part of me that's sort of like you can take your lessons and you can go do whatever you want with it um, but it worked and he was true to his word he helped me find my first apartment he, he helped me decide you know what the best place to live was and how much i should be paying he checked up on me made sure that i was making you know enough money and that it was an actually a move in the right direction and furthermore, he said, if you ever need to come back, we're here. But what he had said, I'd left this part out too, but what he had said when he was talking to me about being a driver was he goes, look, you're the best driver we've ever had. We have never had a driver as good as you and, and uh, we'll miss you if you get bumped up to being an assistant. So it was the combination of that and the fact that I hadn't shown any initiative that made him overlook me for someone else. Also, when I look back on it, I think I have a funny feeling he probably somebody else was on board to be hired and you know who knows how it all went down and uh as i get further and further away from that story sometimes i wonder if i even made it up kind of like the one about me walking out the door and, and then the person walked in no i was there it's all documented i kept journals i remember it well it was a very important time in my getting started right out of college and uh you know, again, he did me a favor. I got just mad enough that I went off and I ended up doing what I wanted. I was complacent, did not care that much. Same thing about me not get, getting into CalArts. Um, I always tell the story about how I applied for CalArts and didn't get in and then ended up having to spend the rest of the summer doing hard labor jobs up, up in Oregon. And uh, um, my mom had said to me all along, she's like, get your stuff in there. You got to apply for the school. You got to do it. You got to take it this seriously if it's something you want to do. And I applied at the very last minute and thought I'd just waltz on in there and uh, did not work out that way at all. Um, as it happens, I have no regrets whatsoever. This direction that I took was perfect. And uh, I don't think there's any one way to get anywhere and do anything. Um, so all's well that ends well. But what she, my mom was trying to point out to me is, is do you want this? Because if you want it, you better go out there and get it. It's not going to come to you. I'm like, really? Everything else did. Uh, not everything. But uh, as far as being an artist, I was kind of the artist in residence in my hometown, uh, in high school anyway. And I didn't realize you got to work for stuff sometimes. But uh, she really made a good point. And uh, I appreciated that. And I was a much better person for having worked hard at, at getting the stuff that I wanted, uh, which I believe I did. Um, and But it wasn't hard work to me because it was something I wanted to do. So to go back to the original idea, it was, um, well, if I'm sitting around on my butt, doesn't that mean I'm lazy and I'm just, you know, oh, when am I ever going to, when am I ever going to find the discipline to do what I want to do? Well, you're probably doing what you want to do right now. That's the problem. And until you find what you want to do, that's not that, uh, you'll do it when the time comes. Also, too, I, I, I tell people that I quit smoking. For years and years, I would try to quit smoking. Mark Twain has a famous quote about that. Um, Quitting smoking is easy. I've done it dozens of times. The joke meaning, you know, and then started again. When I finally quit, it's because I didn't want to smoke anymore. I was done. I was free. I was just, I didn't want to smoke anymore. I'm not judging people who smoke. I did it for 10 years or more. Um, what I'm saying is, is when you want to not do something or do something, you do it. And then if you don't, you don't. 
Uh, doesn't mean you shouldn't motivate yourself now and then. There are times when you get the lethargies. I'm saying just do something. It doesn't matter if you're doing what you love to do, but just do uh, something um, and uh, keep your mind and body occupied with stuff and then it it all works out in the end. But uh, anyway, going on and on about that. So <laughs> learning the software is the part that you hate. And I get it. It's It was the big fuss that everybody went through when CG animation came out. Oh my God, music, sorry, hold on. Um, when a CG animation came on the scene, uh, the hardest part for everybody was how do I take my uh, hand drawing very uh, tangible um, stuff and, and transfer that to software and computers, which is, can be very cold and impersonal and, and not easy to pick up intuitively sometimes. Yeah, I, I get it. Uh, it is hard. And that's, that is one of those things where you probably are going to have to take a class if you have never done those things before. It isn't something you probably are going to pick up uh, that easily. So something to think about. Well, thanks for being empathetic. And found college to be self-teaching. When you figure out how to do something, it's like you're burnt out. <laughs> yeah, so Morning Shark, I, I get it. I absolutely uh, get it. Um, I always tell this story to my students. I say, well, when it's applicable, when, it's, when I'm talking about computer software, is I finally got the bug. I said, okay, I need to learn computer animation. And so I sat down with my book uh, which I always use this one for another couple days. I'm almost done with this class, but I use this as an example. Of, this is what the the Maya book looked like, and there were no teachers, at least not in my world, and uh, there were, you couldn't even get access to Maya. And I had to learn a book like that, and uh, I just hated it. Absolutely hated every minute of it. But you know what? I'd take a, take a break, I'd step back, look at it again and go, you know what? I love motion graphics. I love making things move and I always did. I loved puppet animation and cutouts and just the gamut. Um, I love collages, I love character stuff, titles, anything. I like motion graphics. And i step away from it, come back to it, and then when I came back to it, it looked better. I still hated it, <laughs> but after about six months of that, um, then I finally you know, it, connections were made. And I always say too that I think school is a lot of application. You do have to do stuff on your own. The My role as a teacher often is not comes down to supporting you in whatever it is that you want to do and keeping you from making the mistakes that I made when it was my turn and I didn't have teachers. Um, my, when it was getting started, there just weren't a lot of people who knew how to do it. And uh, there were even less people who knew how to teach who knew how to, they knew how to do Maya, but they weren't teachers. They weren't empathetic. They didn't look at it from the experience of a student who's like, I'm going crazy here. And then come in and say, Hey, well, that's why I'm here to help boost your ego or help you, you know, when you're down um, or I've been there and I, I understand and I'll try to help you through this. Um, a lot of people who taught Maya in the beginning would just say, well, what's so hard about Maya? You put these numbers in and you're done. And uh, off you go. Well, what part of that is hard? I understand it. Why don't you? And uh, as a teacher, I try to approach it from a really um, organic standpoint of, yeah, this stuff can make you nuts if you let it. So um, I'm here to kind of help you avoid those pitfalls and point you in the right direction so you spend less time on floundering around and more time on being creative because I believe everything should be hands-on. Get up and running as fast as you can and then start creating stuff and just keep going. So taking breaks is important. I think it's a portion of finding I have to be forced into doing what I need to do and weirdly I'm grateful for some <laughs> so, well, and that's the other thing I was, we were just talking about this today in my house is, um, yeah, sometimes it's just having a purpose is important. I know somebody who, when they were off work, they would make, uh, they would burn CDs. That's kind of old school, huh? But it doesn't seem like it was that long ago, but I guess it was probably about 10 years ago or more. Um, but they would make CDs and that would be how 
they would stay occupied. And once you burned a CD and made a playlist and you know, before Spotify and stuff, uh, you'd make a list of the songs and then you sort of, uh, what's the word that they use for uh, museums? Um, but you would you know, put the list together and, and curate. That's what I'm looking for. You'd curate a playlist and uh, it give, gives you a sense of purpose. And then when it's done, it's done. You can go off and do something else. And uh, I often wonder about certain people who like extended series of things. Uh, if part of the draw is, is that it never comes to an end so that you can constantly sort of have something going that gives you a purpose in life uh, where it's like, oh, I've got to catch up with the latest episode today. That's you know, part of the joy that comes with something that never comes to an end. Don't know. But... Uh, Well, hi, Gypsy. <laughs> it's nice to see you. Um, yeah. Um, uh, so here's just a little. Fear. Oh, and thank you, Morning Shark, for curating. I appreciate that comment. Uh, you're taking it's important. Yeah. So um, to Gypsy, an old friend, and uh, love watching how I've changed over the years and how the different projects I've worked on. Well, thank you. Yes, it's been a it's been a few years, hasn't it? and teaching and passing on to the next generation. Yeah, well, I always say, um, and people who know me are sick of hearing this, but I say, I had my fun. I had a great time. And I got to a point where it was starting to not be as fun. And that was when I decided to bow out and uh, sh let other people have their chance because I'd gotten my chance. I'd got a lot of chances, actually. A lot of, I had a lot of, I call them angels. I'm not really spiritual that way, but um, I had a lot of people who swooped in and, um, through just being nice people, uh, gave me opportunities. And so I like to do that myself. Not so much in recommendations, because I don't think that, that it works that way. Um, but as far as, hey, I learned these things and I'm more than happy to share them with you and they'll help you at some point. You'll be glad that you know how to do this or that or whatever. Um, and, and, you know, what I recommend people when I can, but it's a touchy one because... Um, the people have to that you recommend have to live up to your recommendation or it makes you look bad haha ha. and I have had a couple experiences with that well, years ago where it made me realize I have to be very careful about my personal reputation uh, such that it is and not put it on the line unless I um, uh, just, just not put it on the line I'll leave it at that and that's the same with all my peers that doesn't mean that I'm not happy to hook people up. Um, I tell the story, one of my shows, uh, there was a student I had who um, was just the most enthusiastic person I think I've ever met and really a good person. And, and uh, I really did want to do something for him. And he said he was coming to one of my shows. Well, already got my attention that way if he was willing to come and support my uh, foolishness. But uh, he showed up, he, I said, if you show up, I will introduce you to somebody. I'm not, you can't ask them for a job and you can't, uh, you know, don't, don't push it, but I will definitely introduce you. And, and once that happens, you're on your own, do whatever you want with that, but you're not looking for a job. You're not going to embarrass me. Um, and this person he um, introduced and ended up exchanging phone numbers with a famous animator. So, uh, you know, you know, totally unsolicited. I had nothing, no part in that conversation whatsoever. Um, but just because he was at the right place at the right time and my friend was maybe in a good mood, I don't know. I actually will have to ask about that at some point. I kind of, I don't know how it all went down, if it was cool or not actually thinking back. But um, again, I wasn't there and the phone numbers were exchanged, so it must have been all right. But anyway, so my goal now is, like I said, to pay it forward and to do whatever I can to uh, pass it to people who are interested in the stuff I'm interested in. And that, I think, is networking. I think that's what networking is, is you've got so many friends that when the jobs come up, um, it's just natural that uh, your friends will say to you, oh, you know, I thought of you because I know that you do this sort of thing and, and I know that that's something that you'd be good at. So uh, I thought of you and put, put in a recommendation, or I thought of you and here's a job that uh, you'd be good at, um, you know, that I know of. And 
So uh, go, go get them. And so th that's more in line with what networking is. Networking is not, hey, could you give me a job? Or, hey, I've got this thing, would you look at it? Um, I mean, like, I've, I've been working on my personal project now for 16 years, and uh, I'm, I'm hoping that somebody will buy it. Would, would you look at it and pass it along to people? And, you know, yeah, that's probably not how networking works. Um, it doesn't mean you shouldn't try it. You should do anything that you have the uh, wherewithal to do. Um, you think about the story of Steven Spielberg and how he jumped off of a train at Universal Studios and uh, convinced people that he actually worked there, set up an office. I think he did. I think that's how it goes. And uh, and then they finally said, well, I mean, you got an office. You're technically here, so we might as well just keep you here. You know, do whatever works. There are no rules. It's just um, make the best of a, whatever opportunity you have and then be prepared when the time comes for somebody to say, well, what else you got? You know, bam, this is what I've got and hit them with everything that you've been working on um, all this time. So that's, I think that's how it works more often than not. I've got some comments. Just want to check some of these comments. You guys asked some cool stuff. Um, what if it's a generational thing growing up with instant gratification? I'm not going to blame anybody. I needed instant gratification when I was a kid. Um, I liked it as fast as you could give it to me. If it was slower, I didn't notice because I was a kid. I didn't know it was coming. So um, I think we all like instant gratification. Um, but yeah, there's something to be said about the fact that things move very quickly now and people want what they want quickly and they know they're just around the corner. There's something else um, that's sparkly that they can look at. So. Sparkly, Secret of Nim. I don't know if anybody knows that film. That's a Secret of Nim. Is the need to learn 2D and computer animation to make hybrids. Uh, only one of these like into the Spider Verse or experimenting on different ways. So the thing about Spider Verse is um, there isn't anything else like that. I mean, I know that when they made um, Paper Man, there was no uh, hybridization like that until pa Paper Man came out, and the same with Spider Verse um, until they made it there wasn't a Spider-Verse and it only exists because they did make it. So what happened with that film is, uh, and well, the same with Klaus, if you know Klaus and the way that that film looks and the hybridization of 2D and CG work on that film, it's like, well, somebody had to do it and they did it and they did it out of labor of love. They did it because they wanted to tell a story and they wanted to do it with 2D animation and they wanted to make some cash if they could and the rest followed. So where there is a need, there's some quote about that, right? Is uh, invention is comes from um, a need, a desire to get something done. And that's what I always say that creativity is, is creativity is you've got a problem, how do I solve it? And uh, so it's all problem solving. And so, um, but what do you need? What are the skills you need? So you need to be, uh, you need art classes. You need to understand art if you want to get into creativity. You need to have an understanding of computers nowadays because everybody uses them. So you need some basic computer classes and you need a lot of art classes. And then the rest, you've got to cater towards what you want to do. I want to tell stories, take story classes, watch a lot of movies, TV shows, but do it with purpose. I want to be an animator, take animation classes. So, um, so to, if you want to do a hybrid, uh, then you need to know an animation in general and at CG Spectrum. <laughs> speaking of which, we've got you know, 2D animation, we've got CG animation, and we've, I believe there's something catered specifically to games. So, uh, you, you know, take some of that along with everything else that you're doing. And trust me, there's time. There is no one animation or any specific class that's going to be the, the thing that does it for you. Maybe it'll help you get a job and that's great, but you're still going to want those other things eventually. So uh, keep growing and changing and keep exploring and do it because it's stuff you're interested in and you love it. Um, so those are some of those. Some of the things that you, you want to be learning when you're talking about computer animation uh, versus or hybrids, so take it all, do as many as you can. And then once you get a job, you're gonna learn on the job. And uh, from that point on, 
uh, they'll probably end up focusing on something specific. And uh, and from that, and just just you know, I I don't like to say this because it doesn't sound as cheery and positive as most of the stuff I like to say, and I, I don't think it's a negative thing, but. Just so you know that you have a brief window of time when you're the new person on the block and you're young and ambitious and probably not making a lot of money, but you don't care where you could be anything. And after that, there's a possibility that you're going to get wrapped into doing specific things because that's what they know you for. That's what you have been hired to do and have been trained as, and now that's how they see you. So it was very hard for some of us to start out as cleanup people and then make the jump to being animators and not everybody even made it. Um, and then, uh, you know, some people get very frustrated when they get out of school and they start doing something. I hear it from generalists who wanted to be animators and they say, well, you know, I can do all these other things too. And I'm not getting to use those skills. And that's kind of why my heart lies. And so it's something to think about. I always say, take whatever's offered and make an opportunity out of it. But there are situations where you find yourself doing something that it's not where your heart lives and you want to uh, be very careful about those first years when you're getting work and, and make sure that you're going down a, a path that you like. For example, I'm not going to bash anything because I think it's all good, but I know people who started out in games as animators first and they, they found it hard to get into doing uh, full on character animation, high quality stuff in say a studio like Disney. Similarly, people who were doing creature effects on a film like uh, Alvin and the Chipmunks had a hard time getting into doing character stuff once they had done what was technically called creature, even though who knows you know, where they draw the line there. Um, Alvin was certainly a 2D inspired CG animated film with 3D characters in it. But by the same token, I also know people who made the jump with no problems. And that's because they were good and they proved they were good and they loved what they were doing. And that love of the craft you know, kept them growing and evolving and getting better and better so that when they got a chance, Disney snapped them right up. Um, so it's, it's kind of a cop out to say, well, you know, they won't let me do this or they won't let me do that. Well, don't let that stop you. The reason I was doing shows is because Carol Burnett always said that she got her start by putting on plays in the boarding house where she lived. And she's like, we didn't wait for, for people to find us. We just put on a show and charged admission. <laughs> Next thing you know, um, I was doing it for a living. You know, she got lucky. You need a little bit of luck, but you also need to make opportunity when, when it doesn't exist. So that's something to think about too. Our game. I also think it's important to make those relationships and see what they're doing and explore what they're making. As far as networking goes, once you get out into the working world, or even if, like, let's say you've gone to a school and um, you've made a lot of friends there, that's going to be your peer group. And you're probably going to be bouncing around with them a lot over the years. And sometimes they'll be their boss, sometimes they'll be your boss. So it's really, really important to be friends with everybody at that point and be a real cool person that everybody loves. The ones that I know who are like that um, are never out of work. And in fact, I just wrote a recommendation for somebody recently who was asking me, you know, hey, could you help me out here? They need to recommend. Well, um, I was thrilled to do it. The person did not even need me to do it. They were just doing it for a confirmation. Uh, <laughs> he already got the job. Um, but it would, I couldn't say enough about this person uh, when I got the opportunity. And that's because he was just a really cool person. Uh, and I. And I, I, even I took a cue from the way he handled inter-office things and um, how cool he was with just, you know, everybody knew him, he knew everybody and they all loved him. And uh, as a result, he's, when we all got laid off from Whitman Hughes, for example, he didn't wait very long before he was working again. And that's been the case ever since, to the best of my knowledge. And it's because uh, we all just thought he was the greatest so that's what networking is to me, just for the record. Um, and yeah, it is a community and a small one, a lot smaller than you think. I'm glad that you like Secret and M. <laughs> yeah, I haven't seen it in a long time, but it's been coming up a lot. I need to, to see that again. The Paper Man was awesome. And, uh, yeah, I think 
DreamWorks had something similar to Paper Man on the boards, and they didn't go with it, and now they've changed hands, so it's a little weird. I don't, I don't know what's going on at DreamWorks feature. The TVs are going great, but um, but they had a hybrid project, and it didn't work out. It sounds like, which is a shame. Um, but uh, they're just, just waiting for one to, to happen. Start as a generalist and shape into something, and it's hard to change. Yes. I've found that to be true. Generalists uh, get pigeonholed sometimes. Definitely need a little luck, but you can increase your luck by being involved in putting effort. Yes, your luck is exponential to um, uh, how much you're out there and trying to get yourself noticed. And, and getting yourself noticed nowadays can be as something as simple as being on Facebook or DeviantArt Art or something. And uh, people, other people who are in the same boat as you who may know what's going on in the biz and then maybe tried what you want to try and can say, oh yeah, I wouldn't waste my time with that place. I see it all the time with my students. They all want to help each other and talk to each other. Um, I said goodbye to a class tonight. They just finished up um, the, the entire 2D animation program. And we all kind of said a tearful farewell. And as we were doing that, they were all handing each other their uh, information so they can stay in touch. And, um, and I know that if they're, gigs come up they'll help each other because that's that's the kind of people they are they're very very cool that group and uh, and that's that's networking that's how you get gigs most gigs you get them by people recommending you or you get recommended one way or another and um, that's what networking is all about at the end any animation book recommendations um, so you know about the Animator Survival Kit, that's Richard Williams, that's uh, number one if you want to do 2D particularly. Um, CG, not necessarily, um, I still think you should have it, if you're, if you're interested in animation at all, you should have it, and you probably already do. Um, but it's a little more of a 2D manual than it is for CG animation, as far as the animation act aspect of it goes. Um, I mean, I would recommend... Is there any, something else that I would consider? So what I would do is um, I would spend a lot of time copying the work of others. Um, the best animation school I can think of outside of the one that I work for, <laughs> um, you know, is uh, that you, uh, you copy work that other people have done. You walk in the footsteps of other artists and see how they did it. And by doing so, you pick it up by osmosis. And that's how I learned to do animation characters um, when I was not working on the job. When If I had some free time and they were paying us to sit around at Disney, which they did quite frequently, actually, which is funny. Don't think they do a lot of that now, but I don't know. Um, I would copy the style of other artists. I would look at a milk call scene and just draw it, just trace it. And by doing so, I would learn a lot about the route that that artist took to get to where they went. And um, and that taught me a thing or two. And the same thing with uh, CG animation, when I would do that, I mean, a little off topic for 2D animation stream, but uh, but it's something I did. And same thing, I would look at other people's work and I would copy it. One of my favorite animation students that I was fortunate enough to get to teach, he, uh, in, in the last weeks of the class that we were in together, which at that point it was just demo reel, um, decided he wanted to do something with the Warner Brothers bent. So what did he do? He went and found a Warner Brothers cartoon and copied what he saw there into his 2D and a 3D CG animation and came up with a brilliant piece of work that ended up being, I think, one of his top pieces on his reel. You know, one of the first pieces on it that anyone would see. Um, and he was able to do that because he was copying Warner Brothers cartoon animation style uh, verbatim. He was just like, I'm just going to take it right from there and see how they did it. And then he adapted it to a CG animation world, to 3D uh, rig that could squash and stretch. Well, he built the rig himself, modeled and built the character himself. So he knew it felt better than anyone and knew what he wanted to do with it. But uh, he used Warner Brothers classic animation cartoons as inspiration and copied them. And I do stuff like that all the time. There's no law against it. We would, when I worked at Disney, I remember somebody said, hey, I'm going to the, the archives to get a scene for Bambi. 
uh, where Bambi was running through the fire for fire for I think it was Pocahontas or Hunchback or something. And you want to go with me? You want to check it out? It uh, it will be fun. And uh, boy, I'm sure glad I did because we got to look at actual animation drawings from Bambi. But there was a whole library of stuff that they would not only use as inspiration, but just take. I mean, they would just verbatim take stuff that had been animated earlier and uh, recycle it, repurpose it, put a new character on it, but use that animation. Why not? It, it's, it was perfect the way it was. Why not just take it and um, uh, resource it, repurpose it in a new way? And uh, I just think that was great. So. Yeah, but anyway, so so books I'd recommend if you really just want to know about 2D animation, uh, Preston Blair is a great resource. Preston Blair, or not Preston? <laughs> I have the worst handwriting of anybody I know, but Preston Blair is a great resource. Richard Williams, you already know that's the uh, animator's toolkit, and uh, obviously Illusion of Life is one of the founding books. It's the first one that I got. I took my $30 that I um, had. I don't know how I had it actually. I was in art school and Illusion of Life came up. And I think what it was is my parents gave me a budget and gave me um, a certain amount of cash every week to survive in Portland, Oregon while I was going to PNCA, the art school there for one term only. And I think I snuck it under the table instead of buying SpaghettiOs that week I bought, I saved up my money and I pay the 30 bucks it costs to get the illusion of life. And <laughs> the price is legible. Hey, I had to work hard to make it legible for you guys to see that. Trust me. I mean, if I was doing it my way, I would have you know, pressed and Blair. How's that? And when I, I sign my name, I sign it like this. It's actually become, some people who know me know that it's kind of a thing with me that I'd sign my name a certain way. But uh, yeah, it's an illegible scrawl. If you had just come into this stream and you saw that, would you guess that that was Preston? I don't know. My mom had such high hopes for me to be a doctor when she saw my handwriting. But thank you. I appreciate that, that, that you find it legible. Um, but yeah, Preston Blair Illusion of Life. I bought it when I was um, in art school and it changed my world, Illusion of Life. I don't know that I'd use it as a technical reference so much anymore. It's This stuff is there, but it's not up to date. It's talking about how things were and things have changed a lot. Um, but um, but these books, Richard Williams, Illusion of Life, Preston Blair, um, though they're still relevant in that they teach you to be an artist first and foremost. And if you want to do 2D especially or any hybrid with 2D, if you want to be an illustrator that works with motion graphics, if you want to do cutout animation, which I'm not even talking about, maybe I'll talk about that uh, in an upcoming stream, um, then you sure as heck better know your way around art and know how to draw and know how to um, and know aesthetics and things like color theory that stuff's all going to come in handy so you should know it um, so just just some things to think about um, professor animation says we took a shot that was a few seconds long and spent forever recreating it oh um, that's cool yeah that's great so we can learn from past masters um, there's no reason not to. They, there's no reason to reinvent the wheel. They've already invented it. Just uh, just when you build your version of it, build it right. That's the only thing to keep in mind. Just for the record, I'm now going to be drawing a, an exaggeration frame because I think it'll be easy to do while I'm yammering away. Uh, so the frame between these two is a very stylized piece of exaggeration where I'm not going to use the first the drawing before or after it. I'm going to just be drawing this weird mutated uh, exaggeration. So that ought to be fun. Um, but yeah, so those are some so those are some of the books that I recommend. Um, but there are a lot of resources out there. Sometimes I shouldn't say this, I guess, because you should come to CG Spectrum if you want to learn. But um, sometimes I recommend going on. Uh, uh, just typing keywords into a web search and you find resources that way. And there are a lot of books that have been uh, that have been downloaded. Uh, sorry. There are a lot of books that have been transferred into 
PDFs and things like that that you can get if your if money's tight. It shouldn't stop you from learning. It shouldn't stop you from growing. And again, the resources that are available out there right now are vast, and so make use of them. Really, I guess what I'm saying is there's no excuse not to uh, to keep evolving. And uh, as I often say, I did it when there were no resources available to me at all, living in a small town uh, with a small library and people who, when I'd say, oh, I want to be an animator, they'd say, what on earth are you talking about? Um, I did it anyway. I still found a way to do it. I think my first camera was a, a Super 8 that didn't have the ability to do stop motion. So I just push and just get two to three to four frames every time I pushed it. And that was, hey, it was something. It was better than what I'd been doing before. And then my mom took pity on my plight, found at a garage sale a uh, Super 8 camera that you could actually do frame by frame. Unfortunately, I think my stuff got worse after that because I just didn't have the skills or the training that I needed. And then the big breakthrough came for me when I was in college and I took a motion graphics class, which was the class where I had a 16 millimeter camera available. It was a newsreel footage camera, uh, but um, I had the ability to actually shoot things and pencil test them. And through that, I was able to uh, finally create my first film animated that was made entirely out of flip books. Some weeks back, people said, hey, um, I was talking about my video that I had that went viral, kind of. They're like, oh, can you show that? And I showed that one. It was just a remix video. It had nothing to do with the animation whatsoever. And everybody's like, well, wait a minute, what? Uh, we thought we were gonna get, you were going to show us some reanimation. I am specifically not showing it because a um, well, couple things. One, I don't know that it's a, a showcase of animation and the kind of things that you'd do if you were at uh, CG Spectrum doing 2D animation. I'm not, it's not that I'm not proud of it, I just don't know that it's a good endorsement of the kind of stuff that the school does, and that's really why I'm here, is uh, through CG Spectrum. The other reason is, um, it's a little on the, I don't, I don't know what you'd call it. it, it's not necessarily suitable for all audiences. I remember I showed one of my films, a live action film, in my house, and my sister's young child was there, and it had a lot of adult language in it and my mom at some point had said oh we shouldn't be showing this it's terrible you know that my sister's son had seen it and my sister who's one of the coolest people around um, who I think has great morals but she said look he's seen it 17 times already what's it gonna hurt to watch us screen it one more time he's already seen it that's it's over we're not worried about that anymore better yet do what she did which is explain it to him or however she handled it later um, and he grew up to be a very moral person um, so that was uh, not a problem in that house but anyway but yeah I just I have a, a hard time justifying showing my stuff here when it's not that's not what this is about but talk to me sometime outside of here and uh, if I get to know you and I think you're cool and I don't think you'll uh, abuse the privilege. Um, yeah, sure. I usually show my short film, my animated films to my students uh, at, at the end of the class when I feel like I can trust them and uh, that they're not going to, that they'll understand the spirit with which the films are made. Again, I'm not embarrassed by them. It's just, I don't, that there's a time and a place for them and out of context, I don't know that they uh, work. Plus, I want to see people's reactions. I always say that one of them, uh, I was about getting laid off from a job and I had just been laid off when I, my buddy and I, we worked in the same studio, we came up with the idea and we thought, oh, well, let's make a really cynical, sardonic film about uh, what happens after you've been laid off. And uh, for years, people would say to me, oh, you poor thing. Wow, you were really in a bad mood when you made this. And I'm like, but it's supposed to be funny. It's a humorous take on somebody who's very depressed because they got laid off. And I thought everybody would get it and they just didn't. Well, then it showed at the DreamWorks Film Festival uh, on a big, huge digital screen that was a very expensive screen, uh, but the audience was full of people who were uh, about to be laid off or, or afraid they were going to be laid off. And suddenly the film played like a dream. And uh, that always made me laugh. Everybody laughed at all the jokes. They thought it was funny and clever. And they came up to me later and said, wow, that was really on point. You really got it, didn't you? 
And that was the first time that it ever happened. And I think it had been mm, 10 years. I mean, it made the film in 1993. And I think this was about 2003 when it finally found its audience. Who knew that uh, finally my film Bob is Dead would find... No, no, it wasn't. It was uh, Terminated. Finally, my film Bob the Terminated would, would find its audience. And it looked great, too, in 35. It was shot in 35, so it looked really cool. I'm thrilled that I got to show my film and that people really enjoyed it. Um, it's on YouTube. You can find it. It's, it's not that big a deal. I, I don't hide it. Um, just look up Terminated on YouTube. It terminated by S. Claus. I always went by S. Claus. I thought that was funny. Santa Claus Presents. <laughs> um, and I still go by that too. Plus, I think it's, I don't know, it's a, just sort of a generic name. It's, there are no prepositions, presuppositions that go with that name. Uh, other than Santa Claus, but yeah, I think I think it's available. I think you can look on YouTube if you want to see it. Terminated by S. Claus, and then the other one is Attack of the Mad Housewife, or I think it's Attack, um, and same thing by S. Claus, and you'll you'll see them on there. I don't uh, I don't hide them, but I'm not gonna show them here or endorse them or anything uh, at the moment. Um, questions. So, you're considering taking an online class once you got an income, tried animation mentor and didn't take it seriously. Yeah, I mean, that's the same with every class, and I'll say that about my classes uh, is there's no, it's not about holding your hand and forcing you to do stuff you don't want to do. If you don't want to do it, you don't want to do it. Nobody can make you do anything. Um, all I can do is I can point in the right direction and say these are the tools, these are the things that you need to know, and then be a champion in your corner urging you on. When you take a class from CC Spectrum, you've got a schedule. They believe hours anyway, the 2D animation ones, two, 12 weeks, and for 12 weeks you immerse yourself in this stuff, and I just go on and on like I'm doing now and, and show you everything I know, and um, me and my, uh, my co-mentor uh, we just show you everything that we can think of. Like, you know, it's a discipline class that takes you through it, uh, the process, uh, starting with the bouncing ball, 12 principles, the usual. And then by the time you're done, you do your own piece that's a dialogue piece. And uh, and by that point, you know, we we're, we're, are really just holding your hand and, and urging you to finish because by then you know everything that, that we can teach you. Um, and some people, uh, really excelled. Some people, they don't quite finish. Uh, they don't quite get to where they wanted to go. What I always say is, is even if you didn't get where you wanted, even if you didn't make the next great short that's going to go viral on Vimeo or YouTube or something, but you learned something. And maybe what you learned was you don't like animation anymore, you know, or, or that you weren't cut out to do it or whatever, but you would never have known that unless you tried. And the, the mere act of going through these classes and trying uh, so for what you said about animation mentor, okay, well, maybe you didn't do it. Well, maybe you realized it wasn't something you wanted to do all that badly after all. I don't know. I don't know what, uh, motivates people or doesn't, but just think about it. You know, all the things that you're going to use that you got from that, and you probably don't even know that you got from it. Uh, it pays off, trust me. And I say that from experience as most of these things that I get very adamant about. I know from experience, I did it myself, and you can do it too. Um, I took conversational French because I worked at DreamWorks, and everybody, well, a lot of people, they were French, and I wanted to get better at it. And uh, I think I'm better at French now than I was then, and it's because I took that class and thought about it and let it percolate over the years. Um, I dream in French sometimes, and that's they say that's a good sign that you've assimilated the language. So, uh, you know, even if it doesn't seem like there was a one-for-one -one with what you, the class you took and where you ended up, uh, you'll see one day it's gonna, it's you, you'll you'll be glad that you got those skills. So, looking at some of these comments and. Uh, So yeah, what about the COVID thing and how it's um, 
um, put a damper on things well, but look, it gives us an opportunity and excuse in some people's cases to be stuck at home and work on some of those projects you always said you'd do. Um, for me, I'm still waiting for that moment to happen, which don't get me wrong, I'm not complaining. I've uh, been, uh, work has been very steady through this time for me because I've been doing classes online, which I love to do. Uh, but um, but it has actually picked up for me, and so I'm, I'm still waiting for that moment when I can do all those projects I've got lined up. And there's a long list at this point. Uh, so yeah, we can always find more time, and there's always, I wish I had more time. When I was at Disney, I would come home after doing 10 hour days and uh, write on my novel that I was writing at the time, which by the way, I never published it. I never will, because I don't think it's any good. But at the time I did, and I would, go home and the minute I was done with work I would jump onto my writing and I'd write until midnight. I was young, I had energy, I had a drive, I was into it and um, nothing could stop me from doing it because I just wanted to and uh, that was my fun. At the end of the day drawing for other people I got to go home and do my own thing and write and I know a lot of animators who do that. They'll get done with their job and go home and animate on their own stuff does that make them better people than you of course it doesn't it's just that's what they want to do and i've i've gotten that a lot of people have said to me uh, throughout the years of my career or my time on this planet actually they said wow you did that i should do that too or i don't do that huh you know, oh i must be a lazy slob or something <laughs> because it, it's like but see to me it's not work to me it's what i do uh, for fun and i choose to do it it's not um it's it's not punishment it's not a chore it's what I do because I enjoy doing that with my spare time for whatever reason so don't feel bad about spending your spare time however you choose to, to uh, spare it uh, to, to spend it sorry and uh, don't apologize for being chatty I appreciate it it's fun it makes these uh, sessions more fun when uh, people are interested in things and asking questions I think and uh, maybe it does for people out there too at any time, if you want me to show you something specific that's directly related to animation skills, I am at your disposal. But um, speaking of being chatty, other than that, I'll just keep going on and on until you, the subject changes or until people don't talk anymore, at which point I'll just talk about what I'm working on. Um, Drawing School asks, is it possible to do movies, games, and animation? Clyde Barker is a person who has multiple occupations. Well, I always say this about um, uh, Stephen King, J.K. Rowling, people of that ilk. When you're talking about Clyde Barker, that is somebody, that's Clyde Barker. There's one Clyde Barker out there, lucky him. He got really lucky early on because Stephen King endorsed him. And we all raced out, those of us who are Stephen King fans, we all raced out and bought his um, books because Stephen King said we should. And, uh, I had mixed feelings about, I have mixed feelings about Clyde Barker. I like some of it, some of it I'm not crazy about. Um, but because of that endorsement, he kind of could write his own ticket. And he only had to be good at that point. And uh, he was good enough that he continued to be able to write books and get them published. And um, that led to other things little by little. I think he was a very creative person who really wanted to do everything. He wanted to direct and animate and, or draw, certainly he draws. Um, he could do it all and he wanted to do it all and I think he got some clout to do it all and he did. Uh, and that I think that happens a lot more often than people think. So, but, but it took him having an endorsement from Stephen King to get his start. If he hadn't done that, I think he still would have kept doing it. He just probably wouldn't have gotten the attention he got. And he might not have gotten the budgets he got. You may have noticed, you know, he stopped directing films um, around the time that his films, you know, weren't as successful as maybe Hollywood wanted them to be, or else his budgets went down. The last one I remember he did was the one about the Midnight Meat Train. Is that it? Something about uh, Midnight Meat Train. And I haven't seen it because... My tolerance for Gru has changed a lot as I've gotten older. I would have loved it when I was a kid, but um, as I've gotten older, I just don't have patience for really nasty films anymore. Um, I mean, I still have, that's still part of me. I still respect them and all that. I keep up with it, but I just don't watch them that much. But the, yeah, so it, it had to, um, 
it had to, uh, it, it took being endorsed by somebody famous to get Clive Barker to really be put on the map. I mean, he was a published author and that, that took something as well. But, um, so the, the answer to your question is, it is absolutely possible to do movies, games, animation, anything you like. Look at Tim Burton. Um, but again, Tim Burton was doing all this stuff before he was famous. And the people I know, I know who knew him before he was famous said that that was all he did. <laughs> he didn't do anything but uh, sit around and, and do creative works. And that's one of the reasons why when he got his opportunity, he, uh, he took it and made good use of it is because he was already doing it all the time. So that's my advice to you is keep doing what you love to do. Don't wait to be discovered to do the things that you love. Just do them. And then when you're discovered, you can pull out that bag of tricks that you've got uh, that nobody knows. I have people tell me all the time, they'll, they'll say, I didn't know you played music. I didn't know you did created your own theatrical shows. I had no idea that you wrote novels on the side and that you, um, uh, you know, had done short films or I don't know, I don't know, you, know, you worked in animation. People were like, wow, you really, you, uh, you, uh, you worked on all these films or did creature films or, you know, it was on Oscar winning, you know, it's one of the small staff of the people who, uh, were supervisors in life of Pi and we got an Oscar. Yeah, was like, I didn't know that. And I don't tend to tune my own horn very much, um, especially when it comes to the big films, because we all did those. I, I'm not going to take credit for stuff that I didn't solely do. Um, but I do those things because I love them. I wasn't trying to get attention. I wasn't trying to, uh, I mean, when I say I wasn't trying to get attention, I don't mean as the end all be all. I do projects because I enjoy doing them. If they get, if I get attention for them, then that means I get to do more. And maybe somebody's going to pay me someday to, uh, I mean, that was the thinking, is maybe I'll find a way to make this pay, but that didn't stop me from doing them. And uh, if I make a little money here and there on the side, um, that's a bonus for most of that stuff. Uh, for projects where I don't have to answer to anyone, I just do whatever the heck I want, and then I share it with people, you know, that's the greatest job in the world. Of course, it's going to be hard to get a job doing that. <laughs> Everybody wants that, right? Um, but if you're doing it all along, uh, and then some money f happens to fly your way. Well, that's not the worst thing that ever happened. But you were doing what you love to do all the time, regardless of whether anybody told you you had permission to do it. So that's just that's just my philosophy. I say it a lot. I mean, people get tired of hearing about it. But um, yeah, just keep doing what you love to do. And then when the time comes, you can prove to someone, hey, look, see, I put my money where my mouth is. And uh, I can do this job for you. Give me a chance. Something to think about. This is it's Well, I'm sure glad that you like listening to these. I hope that they are of use and that valuable to people. Um, I, I look at these streams as an opportunity to share stuff like this. Uh, if you want the hardcore knowledge, um, obviously I'm encouraging you to take, to take the classes that are offered. And that's where you're going to get step-by-step -step instructions about, well, how do you do this? What if I want to do this specific thing? Um, how do, what, what do I need to know to be an animator on the job in a technical sense, in a literal sense? What are the skills I need? How do I develop my demo reel in a very specific way? And that's what I do with the classes. And obviously, you got to take them. They're classes if you want to, uh, if you want to get that information. But here, I'm more than happy to talk about general things. Uh, and, and again, I can talk about technical stuff as well. Like, how do you do an in-between specifically or whatever? I'm, I'm at your mercy for any of that stuff but i am also more than happy to share some of the industry stuff that i know and uh, some of the stories that i've got so love to draw do a lot of cartooning we'll keep doing it i mean if you love it keep doing it and um more often than not i've heard stories about people who um, because they love doing it and they shared the work uh, ended up exactly where they wanted to be all along and uh, in the meantime, you had a great time doing it. Uh, I always say to, you know, you got to pay the rent, you have to pay the bills. Well, what if you were like me and you paid the bills by working at Disney Studios in their future animation department on films that are now considered classics and will last forever, and then went home and did your own stuff on the side? 
that is not the, the worst thing in the world, right? And that was pretty much my entire career. I was doing my show Sin. Uh, on the one Sunday, say, Sunday I would have off uh, every two weeks on a film called, I think it was Night and Day, and then Yogi Bear. Um, so as soon as I got done, I'd have one Sunday off uh, every two weeks for most of that summer, which was 2010, I think. And I'd race home and I'd start working on the music for my show, which became a show called Sin. You can look that up. The whole show's online on YouTube too. You can watch that if you want. Again, not an endorsement, I'm just saying it's out there. Um, but I would spend my free time doing the things that I love to do and then go in and work and do a pretty cool job too. Favorite shots I've worked on uh, were, uh, since you asked, were uh, I did this thing with these creatures called Tinies in a movie called The Vampire's Assistant, aka uh, Cirque de Freak. They cut most of it out of the film, but it's up on my YouTube channel. You can see the whole uncut thing. And it's these 12, uh, seven, seven like little dwarves, and they're eating out of a trough, and it's CG animated, and that was my favorite. I got carte blanche, I could do whatever I wanted. The director said, you're sick, and I love it. Uh, just go crazy, and um, he approved it, and I worked on it all summer. It was a very complex scene, but a lot of fun. That is my hands down, my favorite. And then 2D, just anything from El Dorado with Miguel. I would still wish I was working on that. And then Kevin in the Woods. Uh, Matt Shumway and I worked on a lot of the monsters together and Mike Hosel and others. And um, uh, we, we joked that I uh, wish we were still working on that. It was the most fun movie ever. Uh, so those are some of my favorites. I enjoyed working on the last scene of Pocahontas where she does the whole wave. I was one of several in-betweeners on that. Um, it wasn't necessarily a lot of fun. It was a lot of work, but I, I did enjoy working on it. Uh, so those are some of my favorites that, that goodbye scene. Uh, the Hellfire sequence with Kathy Zelinsky. She animated the Hellfire sequence from uh, Hunchback. There's a scene where it starts out, the character of Frollo is about this big and he ends up on a close-up of his face. We were using sheets of paper that were, I don't have anything to compare it to, but they were probably about the size of this notebook. And we were flipping, or bigger, and we were flipping these sheets of paper, uh, drawing close-ups of Frollo's face. And I got to work closely with Kathy, who now is a friend of mine. Um, thankfully, a really great person and fantastic animator, still working in 2D to this day. Uh, so those are some of my favorites, since you asked. Um, and uh, I can keep going on that if you want, if you're interested. But those are probably the top ones that I worked on. I uh, worked on Hellfire. Yes, I worked on Hellfire. I worked on Frollo was my character on that. And I did most of the shots. I cleaned up, did not animate them. I cleaned up most of the shots uh, at the end when Frollo is battling with the Quasimodo and others on, on the balconies and stuff and, and falls to his death. And I remember we, I think we Xeroxed and traced his face so he falls. I don't know, it's been too long. But um, yeah, I worked on the Hellfire sequence exclusively. The film was almost done and, and my lead, a supervisor she said hey everybody's on vacation you want to take this sequence and just just do it you and your team just finish it um, but yes i worked on hellfire with kathy a, a lot of us did and um oh she was having so much fun kathy just loved working on that and we all had fun and uh and i'm very proud of that bit of business i think it turned out great so um how about this i'll, I'll make a deal <laughs> come back next week because we're about out of time, got about 10 minutes, and I'm, I'm all yours. I'll tell you anything you want. Well, anything I can say about the, about the films that I worked on. If you look me up on IMDb, you can see what I worked on, and uh, I'm happy to talk about any of the films um, that you're interested in. Uh, it's my pleasure to share this stuff, because I think it's relevant. I think it's, it's part of the uh, business, is some of these stories. Um, they, they help you prepare yourself and, and take it away out of the realm of, oh, it's magic or it's something that I can't do, or it's all these famous people that you work with, you know, who you end up having lunch with them and they're just real people. Um, so that's part of it. So I'm sorry, John Skull, I missed your comment here. Let me talk about this. It's the person you always want to be is you can do it all. Well, you certainly can do it all if you want to. If you have a lot of ideas, just keep doing it. Just keep creating things and sharing them with people and um, putting them out there, putting them on you know, Facebook, DeviantArt, wherever, you can find that people will uh, can check out your work and just keep doing that. And uh, 
games. Yeah, you, you absolutely can do it. There is no reason why you cannot do whatever you set your heart to do. Everybody I know who focused and said, this is what I want to do, um, ended up doing it. Persistence is probably 75% of why people succeed in Hollywood. Look at me. I succeeded probably because I just stuck around longer than some of the others. Um, and, but I did because I loved it. And so when it was time to learn CG animation, I learned it because I couldn't imagine not doing it. Another friend I have who's at Disney, and who I said this last week, who said, I was meant to do this for a living. And, um, and she certainly was, because she's still doing it, even a lot of other people aren't anymore. Because uh, I have it all, because I have too many characters. There it is. One, two, three, yeah, you said that. Cool. Um, yeah, so, so um, probably part of it for me was naivete. I never looked back once I moved to Los Angeles. It never occurred to me that I could lose everything. <laughs> And, uh, um, or that, uh, you know, we were going through a, a bad time in animation when I got hired, I was protected by the studio I worked at, but a lot of people were out of work, never even crossed my mind. I was young, probably naive, probably self-centered and kind of stupid, or not stupid, but just, uh, just didn't know that much. Once I started to realize how much you could lose when you got laid off, sometimes, um, it became a different matter altogether. And I, you know, started protecting myself more, saving my cash and things. But the first time, I just kind of just kept going, and so uh, that taught me that persistence is is a lot. So stay persistent, continue to work hard, continue to evolve and grow, keep learning, and be a really nice person who keeps meeting people, uh, specifically people who are out there trying to get a job or or doing what you're doing. I always talk about informational interviews. It's um, something that you can do while you're trying to get work is you can interview, uh, if they'll let you, you interview at a studio and say, hey, I'm writing an article about this. Don't ask them for a job. You just say, I'm writing an article, um, compiling information, or I'm compiling information for a job. I want to get a job someday. And I was wondering if I could talk to you about what you do and how you like it and how you got there and what um, what advice you might offer to somebody who's up and coming. Um, I always tell the story that I sent somebody on one of those errands and specifically said, don't try to get a job from this person. And they ended up getting a job from the person anyway. Um, so uh, there are no rules, just you do what you gotta do. But by doing an informational interview, you prove to people that you're interested and you gather information. Um, so uh, so I, I think that that's a great way to to advance. I know that when I was looking at the end of my time at DreamWorks and thinking about changing careers or doing something different, I went and talked to a compositor. And I mean, it, it ended up with me learning that I didn't want to be a compositor when I went and took a class in Shake. And uh, as a result of talking to this person, it seemed like a nice entry level gig uh, for someone like me. And it might have been, I don't know, I didn't get there because I didn't uh, end up, I ended up getting another animation gig very quickly. But when I was thinking, oh, well, what are some other things I might do with some of the skills that I've got? Uh, I ended up pursuing that for a little bit. And I'm awfully glad I did because I, at Rhythm and Hughes, they expected you to be able to do everything or at least understand everything. And uh, you would be, I mean, I did one of the camera moves in Life of Pi, um, but, you know, they readjusted one of the scenes and, uh, you know, did that make me a cinematographer on Life of Pi? Not really, but um, they just said, hey, we need you to set up a new camera for this shot. And because I had done other things, I was able to do that. And I remember thinking, I'm sure glad that I focused on all the different things I can do and not just one thing. Because by doing that, I was able to step up to the plate when they said, hey, can you do a camera? Can you do a roto? Can you do uh, whatever? Um, do you know a little bit about 3D, uh, as in stereoscopic vision 3D, because the movie was in 3D? So uh, it's all good. It's all going to be useful. So keep learning and evolving. All right, we've got about five minutes. I'm going to wrap this up here. Um, just playing my scene now a couple times. So you can see what I've been working on all this time. I was just doing a cleanup pass. I'll probably keep working on this in coming weeks, but it's going to evolve and, and look better and better. Um, that's where it is as far as cleanup goes. I'm just making sure that I tie everything down because I left it really loose in the rough pass. And the tentacles are on another 
layers. I'll probably add those next time too. Um, that will go real fast, but stay tuned and you'll see this evolve. And as I said, come back next time uh, with any questions at all, and I'll be happy to hit them. And I love it when you guys, when, when people contribute, because uh, it's fun for me as well. But I hope you had a great time t today with this session. I hope uh, to see you again in the near future. Also, be sure and check out other streams that are available. Um, there's a listing of them that will come up. Uh, it's on whatever platform you're watching. There should be a listing as well as um, it comes up at the beginning and end of these streams. And you can check out the websites and check out if there are other things that you're interested in, as well as uh, the 2D that we were messing around with today. But, um, uh, but yeah, it's, it's always great to, to see some of you repeat offenders, as I say. Uh, thanks to Drawn Skull and Morning Shark for contributing to the conversations. Um, and, uh, yeah, well, I will, if I see you again next week, we'll keep going, um, and good luck to you and keep creating and take care. Have a good one.